Welcome to tonight's Reflections Arts Festival film screening. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight for the last installment for the film screening of this year. My name is Elfie and I'll be your host for tonight. Now before we introduce the film screening for tonight as well as introducing the panellists, let me just give you a brief introduction on what exactly is Reflections Arts Festival. Reflections Arts Festival is a two-week long arts festival by the Republic Cultural Centre also known as TRCC, here in Republic Polytechnic. This year, we have adopted the theme of resilience in the arts and through the arts 
to reflect how we have persevered as one community to bring forth this festival despite the challenges posed from the pandemic. Our festival is coming to an end very soon, so be sure to catch our Symphony de Republic 13, Against All Odds, and Mixtape Volume 3, Catalyst of Dreams, all on TRCC's YouTube channel. Grey, Does Love Conquer All? is our one and only live performance this year happening at TRCC Theatre this Friday as well as Saturday. So if you are the lucky few who got tickets to this sold-out live performance, we will see you then. Wrapping up Reflections Arts Festival on a very high note, be sure to catch Reflections Closing Bash on TRCC's YouTube channel as well. Now, moving on to the film screening, I am very excited to be screening The Medeka Stories. Now, The Medeka Stories is an anthology of four short films that depicts the lives of the Medeka generations who grew up amidst the uncertainty of our nation, formative years. Directed by four local award-winning uh, directors, Don Arvin, Martin Hong, Priscilla Ann Gek Gek, and Wee Li Lin. Together with local writer Jean Tay, the films look back at memorable experiences set in Singapore of yesteryear. Martin Hong was born and raised in Singapore. He was recently graduated from Nanyang Technological University School of Art Design and Media, majoring in digital filmmaking. Now, his short films have been screened both locally as well as overseas. Don Arvin started experimenting with the video camera since he was 14 years old. His interest motivated him to pursue a formal training in both traditional as well as digital filmmaking. He has worked on more than 25 short films as screenwriter as well as director. He currently directs for TV as well as commercial content. Wee Li Lin is one of the pioneer filmmakers in Singapore. Her work ranges from feature films, shorts, telemovies, as well as online commercial content, and has a distinct comedic and fantastical touch. Lilin has won several awards, both locally as well as internationally. She is also a film educator, teaching film-related studies at various tertiary institutions around Singapore. Similar to Martin, Priscilla Ang Gek Gek, graduated from Nanyang Technological University School of Art, Design and Media, but majoring in filmmaking. She has directed various short films as well as commercial works. She believes a good film can touch the lives of many which she believes can make the world a better place to live in. Now, unfortunately, we, uh, Priscilla and Martin will not be able to join us here this evening, but we have Dawn as well as Lilin on set. Uh, Lilin will be joining us through Zoom. So before we kick off the show tonight, uh, would you guys like to say anything to our viewers out there? Maybe we can start off with Dawn first. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, everyone. And uh, it's good to be here, part of this uh, arts festival. Um, hoping to answer a lot of questions later. Okay. Uh, how about Lilin? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. And yeah, happy to be here. Okay, okay, there you have it. Very short and sweet messages from our panelists. So uh, without further ado, let's kick straight into the film screening for tonight. Ma, I'm back. Are you back? Yes, I'm back. Ma 
你知道我们家里的情况。记得吃午餐。各位，这是梅花，我们欢迎您开始加入。看什么看？再看就做不完了。别害其他人跟你一起吃饭供。This is a quote from my favorite book, Little Women. So, regular means to do something often or do it every day. 笔画。快点来吃饭，我们买了沙爹。爸妈。哇，今天拿工钱啊！对，快点谢谢姐姐。我一定会努力的。上。Ari, hi, hello, uncle. I'm looking for Suing. Thank you, uncle. These are for you, Mrs. Shing. <laughs> Thank you. Come in. Ah, you call me to fix the car? No, no. I can do it myself. 我不相信我的爸爸喜欢我。只要放松和做自己。哥哥，能不能看一眼？我已经说没必要。爸，你就让他看看吧。What do you know about fixing car? Edi, bunuh ni. I see what the problem is here. You see, but you know how to fix or not? Well, I don't really have the tools. We have them.
Waalaikumsalam. Hari ni mak banyak tempahan ni. Mak, abang ni main bola dulu, mak. Hmm, bye-bye. Tunggu. Oh, tunggu. Okay. Eh, Abang! Jom, jom! Iza, salah tu buat betul-betul. Tapi ni bosan lah, Mak. Kalau nak buat, biar betul-betul. Teliti. Warna dia pun tak menarik. Kan lagi cantik kalau warna-warni. Alamak, adik kau dah bangun dah. Mak, kita pergi sana dulu, Mak. Ha, bye baik jaga adik tu. Okey, Mak. Hmm. Rani? Rani? Eh, Aisyah. Eh, apa khabar, Rani? Khabar baik. Terima kasih lah selalu tempangan kami. Ya. Kenapa, Rani? Maafkan saya, Rani. Maafkan saya, salah saya, Rani. Packing, Ma. He really tackled me to a grand sale. And you were so close to scoring some more. <laughs> hey, Adam! My grandson, Adam. Wow, so that was My old army buddy, Uncle Singh. <laughs> Adam will be enlisting tomorrow. Very good, very good. Hey, remember, time you were in this. <laughs> Cannot forget. Very different from today, lah. Dulu ah banyak susah tau. You don't believe? Bring me the album. You brought the album, ah? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You see. Wow, very good photo, ah. Oh, look at that, look at that. Ayo. <laughs> Is that you? Your akong last time, ah, all muscle, ah. We used to call him King Kong, ah. Hey, you, Mosquito. <laughs> One slap we fall down already. Last time, uh, my English very bad. Many things blur. Now also still blur. Lucky King Kong, my buddy. He teach me. He faster, stronger than anybody else. But he never leave anyone behind.
Britain's decision to pull out the troops provided the impetus for Singapore to take over the responsibility for its own defence. Not easy lah, last time. But we did what we had to do. enjoyed the films because I certainly certainly did. Okay, so right now we will be moving on to the Q&A portion of this uh, session. So uh, if you guys have any questions or comments about the film, you guys can leave down your comments and questions in the live chat box and then I will be more than happy to ask the fellow panelists, uh, fellow panelists uh, your questions. So maybe I can kick off the first question. Um, so let's start with Don. Uh, what was the main inspiration behind your film? Uh, so maybe you can introduce which film you did to the audience and then, yeah. Okay, so um, this was a, a group of films done for the Malay Cup campaign. Uh, it was a government campaign back then uh, in 2018 that leaped over 2019. Um, so this was a, was, a, was a campaign film and the one that I directed was uh, The Kampung. Or the Kampung Boy and stuff. So, yeah, so this was uh, really to illustrate and portray uh, the sacrifices uh, the, the Madika generation contributed to our country. Mm. Yeah, inspiration, I think a lot of inspiration came from definitely my parents who are part of the Madika generation. Uh, of course, there's little bits and nuances here and there. So, Jean uh, actually wrote all the stories, she conceptualized all of them and uh, the rest of us, the filmmakers, added colour to them, yeah. I see, I see. So there's a very interesting mix of, you know, different ideas in one film. I see. Okay, uh, maybe we can move on to Lilin. Uh, introduce what film you did and what was your inspiration behind the film? Hi everyone, hi Don. Hi, hi Lilin, hi. 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 Um, so, uh, I, I did Factory Girl, which was the first uh, film that, that showed. And as Dawn said, this was a, a, a campaign um, uh, specifically to celebrate um, people from the Medeca generation and the sacrifices they made. And my parents are from the Pioneer gener generation. So, um, uh, not, not terribly far off in, in, in terms of, um, you know, what, what they've been through, but um, you know, I think the Medeca generation had also specific challenges uh, because it was um, already we were moving into the, the, the 60s and, um, you know, the economy was, was growing and, and Singapore was, um, um, you know, uh, already um, um, independent and, and, you know, getting, you know, we were, we were um, getting on our feet and the economy was, was growing. So... Factory Girl, um, and as Don mentioned, Jean Tay uh, wrote um, all the stories, but I believe each of the directors, I can only speak for myself because Jean is actually a, a good good friend and we've collaborated before. So I also had a hand in, in working on the on the script with her. And um, I I was very excited to take on this, this, this story and I felt I really needed to do it justice. I must admit that it, when I was uh, when I was given the brief and and when Jean sort of gave me the brief idea of the story she wanted to do, I was quite daunted because I felt I will never be able to understand what's it like as a young woman who's doing well in school, who has to sacrifice, um, you know, uh, uh, her studies to earn money for her family. So that that immediately got me thinking. I, you know, this character is so different from me. You know, I came from a family where my, especially my father, put a lot of emphasis on his, especially his daughters, reaching the highest <laughs> level of education, possibly, you know, possibly. And there was a lot of support for that. 
And, and, and so I, I really empathize with the protagonist. And I also ask myself, like, how am I going to find a way to relate to her? Because she's so different from me. And I think as a filmmaker, and I'm sure Dawn will agree that, um, you know, this is a challenge we'll face when we're given, you know, when we're given a, a story and a, maybe a character that seems so different from us. And I, I'm a Gen Xer, so what do I know of the Medeca generation, right? So after doing some research and also talking to a few people, I realized that I had a relative who went through exactly the same thing. Um, actually, it was, it was my mother-in-law. Um, she had to give up uh, school. Uh, she's a pioneer generation. But she had to give up school to, so that her, her brothers could study because the family was very poor and she had to sell newspapers and magazines. And, um, and you, you find that that's really not, um, not uncommon at all for people from the pioneer and the Medeca generation that... Um, as, as, as a woman, sometimes you had to, education maybe wasn't valued as much if you're a woman um, versus if you're a man. So some of the things that I wanted to do with Factory Girl is I wanted to give it kind of a, a slightly more feminist spin. So uh, we added in that she actually taught the other girls English through Little Women. And I thought Little Women, which was a book she would have studied in school, you know, be became kind of inspirational for her. And somehow, even though she did not manage to go to school, and who knows, maybe after she became supervisor, she could have, you know, funded her way back to school. And, and she probably would, you know, because she was such a good student in, in, in the story. Um, so there were things like that that we added a spin. And also, I felt that that was something I could relate to, this idea of against all odds that, you know, you would continue to, persevere for, for what you love. And for her, it was books, it was learning. And I also thought the element of friendship was interesting to me and that I could relate to because I have explored that in my films. Um, and it's something I like to write about. And I felt that I could relate to the her when she entered the factory and she didn't know anyone and the girls were kind of like, you know, like talking about her and not really welcoming her. And she slowly won them over and slowly she found her place. So that was a really fun element for me. And I felt that was my entry point into making the story authentic for me. And I was very pleased with the actors. Um, we actually spent quite a lot of time rehearsing and talking about the characters. And I also asked each of them, like, can you relate to who you're playing? You know? So I, I you know, the lady who played the mother, the, la the, the, the actor who played the father, and each of them said, no, it's so different from their real experience, you know, especially the lady who played the mother. She said she's extremely close to her daughter and she could not imagine asking her daughter not to go to school. And, you know, so they talked about relatives that they knew, you know, people that they knew that were in similar situations with them. And the lead actress who played the factory girl, she said that she's the apple of her family's eye. Like <laughs> basically she's the, you know, she's so well loved. And so we all had to find a point of entry into these characters and to do the story justice. Um, so yeah, that, that was my experience. It was an extremely positive experience. And as Dawn mentioned, we filmed in Malaysia, which was really fun. Um, and, uh, um, and, you know, uh, but the actors were from, uh, primarily from Singapore. Yeah. I see, I see. That is a very interesting concept for the film itself. All right. So uh, we have our first question from the audience uh, from Fandi Rohaizad. May I ask, how were you able to find all these locations before starting to film? Uh, maybe we can start off with Dawn. Oh yeah, so uh, for specifically this film, right? Yeah. I'm guessing, yeah. So uh, this was, uh, all, the entire film was shot in Malaysia. So mine and Lilian's one. And for obvious reasons, if you see, you know, it's hard to find such spaces. <laughs> in, we only have one kampong and, and it's been overused. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it's like kampong means it's dead. Uh, so, uh, so for this, I mean, this was done like three years or four years ago. Uh, we had the luxury to travel and shoot this in. So it was shot in Malaysia. So in short, uh, yeah, it it wasn't you don't. It's not hard at all to find such spaces in Malaysia. Yeah. I see. I see. How about uh, Lilin? Yeah. It, uh, in terms of locations, it was quite a dream because the producer 
presented me with the deck and every single location was like awesome. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is great. So we were really spoiled for choice. And um, in the end, uh, we had to fly to KL to have a recce. And um, the original location that I wanted became unavailable or looked different when we visited. So just before I flew, we actually visited eventually the location that you see, which is the factory location. The, the, the house location we had, um, we had uh, kind of, you know, settled on that. So it was, it was, um, it was, it was really a treat uh, to have this range of, um, you know, locations that look uh, appropriate to that era. And I think that becomes a bit of a challenge when you film in Singapore, but it was um, nice that we could bring our actors over and we, we had a, we, we, we had a great time. In fact, there's a scene in Factory Girl where, she, um, you know, she has to, she has to break the news to, or rather her mother has to tell her that she, you know, she has to stop school and, and she has to start working and um, they, you know, the uncle has found a place for her in the factory and the mother cries. But we were enjoying our, <laughs> ourselves so much in KL. We were having such a fabulous time and we all got along really well. She couldn't cry. So the lead actress, Alexis, was so cute. She took um, the lady, Amy, who played her mom. They went to the back of the house, talked to each other. I spoke to them. And then after an hour, finally, we shot <laughs> the scene. But um, yeah, we had, such a, we had such a wonderful time. The crew were wonderful. Uh, but the primary team, they came from Singapore, the cinematographer, the assistant director, and the producer, and, you know, myself and the actors, the, the, the main actors, we all, we all came from Singapore. Yeah. I see, I see. You, you mentioned that the, you know, the mum and the daughter had uh, uh, challenges to cry, right? So uh, what, what was the method to, over to overcome um, that challenge? Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Can use eye drops. <laughs> no, but seriously, they conjured it themselves. I, I, and it's funny because when we had the rehearsal in Singapore, we had the rehearsal in my house. Wow, you know, we all of us felt very emotional. We felt, and you know, it's not that we didn't feel emotional when we went to KL, but I think it's the thrill of being in KL in the new space. We felt like we were on holiday. We're like, wow, I was having so much fun. We're eating all this good stuff. Uh, but usually, and I'm sure a lot of, actors and directors will face that. So at that moment, I spoke to Amy, who played the mom, and, and you know, I said, how can we, you know, how can, how, how can you get to this point? And Alexis, who played the daughter, she was very sweet. She stayed in character, and then she took her mother, and she brought her to the back of the house, and they started talking. And then I went over Kipo a bit. And then when they came back, when they, when they stayed in character, and they talked about, um, you know, the mother explained to her why she had to go to school. She explained why she didn't want to go to, you know, why she didn't want to leave school. You know, this was, you know, she would be the only one in her family who would have like, uh, you know, reached a, have a proper education. So after a while, um, Amy imagined that Alexis was her actual daughter whom she's very close to. And then, and that, that's when, when she felt it and, and that's when she cried. Yeah. But it, it took a while getting there and that's no fault of uh, Amy who's quite a new actress, but I think she did really, really well. But, you know, sometimes it just, it just takes time. Whereas, you know, when Alexis, um, the scene where she's looking at the book and then she cries, that came very easily to her because there was a message written on the book which represented her past, you know, and it said, um, you know, for excellence in literature. And then, you know, it just, it just came to her. And sometimes as a director, you don't have to do too much, you know. It's just a matter of helping the actor get into the frame of mind. And sometimes you need to give them some space to reach, to reach that um, emotion on their own, you know, and not, not, not that make them feel pressured or they're being watched. You know, they have to arrive there on their own also. Yeah. Mm, I understand. Okay. Uh, we'll circle back to Don. Uh, we have a question from the audience as well. Uh, from Isma Chowdhury. Uh, what are some difficulties you faced when filming during COVID? Now, I know the films were filmed in 2018, close to 2019, mm -hmm. right? Um, if you guys were to film during COVID, 
what would you think would be different? Uh, okay, so now we are we have been filming during COVID. Mm. Uh, mm, of course, the margin. I mean, definitely with everything with the safety measures and all, there's a. I mean, I think every department has their own set of uh, restrictions, and I think um, we can even go on from how the industry has changed, how creatives have changed, and I. I think it's a huge big change but i think um, this topic i think we'll have <laughs> we can have a, a, a talk by itself mm -hmm. but generally i think um, no one uh, expected this change so i would say on a very basic level of course uh, uh, we're taking all kinds of precautions uh, uh, and and it's just that i think a lot of the pre-production and and the, the human connection that we used to have, you know, especially because it's such a, we are such in a collaborative uh, industry and uh, we kind of like, I think two years back, um, when we all were like, okay, where is this going to be hit about? And uh, we were trying to find a way of, so I think, and with the own restrictions, so for example, I think we had this whole, um, you know, a lot of stuff that are shot on houses. So uh, we had to follow the restrictions placed on households, for example. So if it's like only five people, I think we even have it, we had it last year during um, uh, heightened alert. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so and it means like only five people can go, or only two people. I think there was once, I think we need heightened alert, I think it was two people. Mm. So then it was almost impossible for, for budgets which were of lower in, in nature. Of course, the commercials, so we could get an unoccupied place and, and set, decorate it and, and do it. But uh, uh, a lot of the work that came from also from television, you know, so there was a lot of delays. And, and so this became huge uh, challenges in every way, economically, physically, emotionally, right? Um, but I think overall, uh, we are still finding our way and we're still managing it. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and, but generally, the fundamentals stay the same. And I think uh, we just are being extra careful. And sometimes uh, we, I mean, I think whatever the government has done, whatever they have done, they've made it actually very easy for us and, and still uh, we are still thriving in that sense, and uh, but I think the big fundamental change is uh, as much as every each of one of us, you know, you guys can be students, uh, and every one of us are living with that change, and and production has has to has changed in that way, in that sense that we all have to take the the precautions. Yeah. Mm. With that, would, would you also say, you know, um, COVID changed the film industry as a whole? Uh, I guess I, I, I'm not sure because I think for me personally, two years, I have been taking quite a break. Uh, so uh, I, I don't really know whether it's from what I've heard, I think it's going okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely has changed, of course, movies and the, the film industry on a larger scale definitely has changed. Uh, I don't know whether I'm the right person to, to comment or talk about it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you know, even I have seldom gone to the cinemas as, as well. Mm -hmm. But certain things have changed, right? Your OTT platform has, has come up bigger and, and stuff. Uh, locally, I think um, mm, there's a lot of stuff that's still going on. We're still finding our way. Uh, but of course, a filmmaker perspective, I think each one, we do have our own struggles, I believe. Uh, I personally have had my own struggles. Uh, uh, but uh, I think we don't forget the core of what we always want to do. So of course, COVID has changed mentally how we want to see the world as. And I think it, it still goes back to, to creating stories, like how much have, have we changed. I think what COVID has personally taught me is just that uh, to understand life better because if you you know before COVID I've been like okay passionate we do films and everything you know but then COVID has changed like if you don't understand life then I don't know what are you trying to do in the film yeah, mm, I yeah. See. that's very interesting for yeah. you to say as a whole um, okay we have another question from the audience as well uh, directed to Don uh, your film the Kampung has a lot of actors from different you know races. Mm. Uh, how did you source out for those actors and actresses? Yeah, I, I, I like how Lillian can remember everything very vividly. I'm, I'm trying to... <laughs> my memories. 
Uh, I remember, I think, um, the lead actors, I think uh, the father, mm, the son, uh, the father, the, 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 the Indian the guy, the chap who would, who would woo, woo the girl, and, and the, her mother and her were all from Singapore. So we all flew into Malaysia. The supporting actors, uh, so everyone, the kampong, the boys, the, the Malay neighbour, we were all were supporting cast from, from Malaysia. So we had a team there to, to source out for, for us there. We had auditions and all that. So uh, uh, yeah, it was, it was crazy in that sense, uh, uh, putting all of it. And I still remember that we had a huge weather issue mm-hmm. and uh, to complete it. And you know, filming in Malaysia is very different in Singapore in the sense that um, there's a bigger team, mm-hmm. but also I personally find it much more warmer there. <laughs> so it's it's very challenging in that sense, and then out of the whole warmth, there was a whole thunderstorm, and everything was delayed. But in the end, so if you see the last finale scene, where you know we were supposed to finish this at like probably five p.m., five thirty, but because of the thunderstorm, I think that was like at six plus, close to seven. Oh, okay. So everyone, so I think we all like everyone was like together so i think there was a kampong within a kampong itself everyone's like, okay we need to get the shot you know come on. we were all i know we were all flying like you know because light was just going down down and you know everyone's okay we've only got a few takes to go so that the last scene or shot i remember everyone's pushing the car out yeah that was like really like okay we got it and done so everyone is like, okay we needed to finish this so in that sense high ironic like so this one i can faintly remember because and the clock was ticking, the producer was like pressuring me and everyone was just like, okay, what do we do if we don't have it in the can, you know, you can't fly out. <laughs> so, yeah. I see, there, there was a lot of... I, I mean, this is a faint thing I can remember, like, I cannot remember as much as how Lilian can remember. <laughs> but this one I remember because it was like, oh, no, it's like everyone was like, what do we do? It's just like thunderstorm, yeah. I see, those were the unforeseen circumstances yeah. that you couldn't foresee. Okay, um, we have another question from the audience. This is directed to Lilian. Um, touching on the, uh, you know, COVID impacting the film industry, uh, we have questions from one Iron Nautics. What are your plans on your future film productions? Um, kind of like, uh, thanks for that question. Kind of like Dawn, I also felt these two years were a bit of a pause for me. And... Um, and, and that also, you know, uh, gave me time to do other things like, you know, learn how to be a bit more human because when you're directing or you're on a film set, it's very all-consuming and sometimes you forget about your life <laughs> outside of making films. So I'm grateful for that. Um, I would say, you know, in, in, in the seeing how COVID is and, and hopefully things will wind down, um, with COVID and, and I think um, as a human race collectively we're all praying for that to happen um, I, I, would, I would say that streaming platforms are gaining they really were very powerful but now they will become almost like the de facto way in which most people will watch content right um, you know aside from YouTube and maybe TikTok um, and, and I actually see it as a good thing because I feel that as a filmmaker, if you rely on cinema release, it's, it's also very daunting. Uh, and sometimes how the film fares in the box office is not an indication of the value of the film or the merit of the film. Especially in a place like Singapore where um, our you know, audiences tend to go for um, you know, anything but a, a Singapore film. And I think even for someone like Jack Neo, it, you know, it, it's it's also still a struggle. So I feel like the streaming platforms give filmmakers like Don, myself, you know, Pris and Martin, um, uh, you know, a, a chance uh, uh, to have whatever we are going to do seen on, um, on avenues that are not just a cinema release, right? So say if, if Don is interested to make his first long form film, you know, that's something that he can consider or for me to consider. Um, so I, I, I would say that that's interesting to see how things go and whether some of the international players um, will look more into Singapore content so that, you know, folks like Don, Pris, 
you know, Martin and myself can get opportunities to put Singapore stories out on a more international platform. Um, so, you know, and it's really been happening for some of our regional, um, uh, you know, like the, the, uh, uh, the regional filmmakers. So, you know, fingers crossed that, that there can be more opportunities for Singapore storytellers to have uh, this international platform. And then we continue to grow our local platforms and, you know, uh, create content that is, um, you know, just, just keep improving on it. And um, yeah, but I would say that, uh, yeah, the past two years were, was like a pause, but I, I think as a creative folk, sometimes that pause is welcome. And like Don said, I totally agree with him is that, you know, sometimes we just forget how to, <laughs> how, how, how to like kind of be human. And um, because making a film is so all consuming um, and uh, it's so hectic. And sometimes we don't spend enough time with our families or even friends, um, you know, and, and we need these human experiences <laughs> to, 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 to enrich our, our creative journey as well. So um, yeah. <laughs> I see. So you guys heard it here. Uh, it was. It's very difficult to produce even a short film, you know, despite all the you know COVID restrictions and all that. So I hope you guys enjoyed the short films that we premiered tonight, and thank you so much for joining us here in the last installment for film screening for Reflections 2021. Now, we would like to take this opportunity to thank every single one of you and express our gratitude for your continued support in watching our film screening series. So we hope you've had an enjoyable time because I'm sure I did. I certainly did. And we look forward to having you guys in for the next Reflections next year. So take care and stay safe. Bye-bye. <laughs>